Politus, Politus, I always get that wrong. Um, we're here in Greece. George has been just an absolutely wonderful host. It was uh, phenomenal to see so many places in Greece. We had just finished the show in Bologna, Italy, where I was able to, with Catherine, see about half of the um, uh, Fabriano Watercolor Society show up, um, which is actually quite a few. So there was, I think about 20, 2,500 um, different paintings from all over the world. So it was just wow. really interesting to see. And um, here in uh, Greece, it's wonderful to see George. Um, Greece has been absolutely a, a wonderful place to see. Um, George has been our guide. We've seen the green valleys. We've seen the monasteries up on, hang on to the sides of mountains. It's just been absolutely wonderful. So today, and I, and I apologize with my iPad, I'm not seeing people on um, Facebook. So I'm going to ask if uh, Anna and Ethel and Letiza um, can forward any messages they might be, or questions they might be asking. George is going to be um, going over um, some of the colors he likes, some of the text techniques he uses. Um, not necessarily doing a finished painting. So if you have questions, please ask any questions. George is a phenomenal teacher. Um, he does workshops all over Greece. Um, we're gonna be going to Santorini next and George does actually workshops in Santorini. Hey, George. Uh, that's uh, if something of interest to you. It's, uh, we'll put up information about George's workshops. I'm a, With I'm that, I'd like to introduce to I'm just about to share in our chat, uh, John, okay. the uh, workshop uh, details. Okay. okay. So we'll, we'll flash it on screen or we'll do a share screen just so our guests um, in Facebook would also come to know about, about the workshop just quickly. Um, George may wanna share about the details here. It's on the screen now, George. Hi, ah, yes, yes, I see it. So thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you very much, John and Catherine, for being here with me. It's been a great pleasure. And we have had awesome time. I mean, I was over the top. I loved every every moment. So um, the main workshop to, uh, to take place is in Sandorini uh, in July. 10th to uh, 17th of July. And uh, if we uh, can later, I can, if we have time, I can show even photos from pre previous workshops uh, where we go, what we do, it's fantastic. But uh, nevertheless, um, that is something that gives me the opportunity to create several paintings from Sandorini, paintings that John and Catherine saw and probably we can show here um, in my studio. Um, I've been working on Sandorini as a subject for the past four years. So I have created a small series of paintings up till now. And I hope it continues to flourish over the years. Uh, yeah, and there will be another workshop at the end of July combined a workshop in Thessaloniki and TV That's it. So George, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and take over. Um, again, if you have any questions, please just ask George directly. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, I should start perhaps with my two sets uh, that um, I was honored to be offered by Daniel Smith. Uh, one is mostly used for my landscapes, and I use Queen Acridon Gold, Cerulean Blue, Green Apatite Genuine, Indian Throne Blue, Mayan Orange, and Moon Glow. Its color is very important for me in my landscape paintings. Queen Acridon Gold mostly because it gives me a beautiful glow, and I use it as a starter in... Uh, my washes in my layers, uh, the color will show through uh, as many layers as I may uh, introduce. And the beautiful thing is that it will show through no matter if I add 
some of the darker or uh, more granulating colors, even colors like uh, bloodstone, which I hold as one of my granulating heavy art artillery, let's say. So uh, I will try to show some of these, how I use them, or, or perhaps even in uh, uh, a painting as it goes. Then colors that I use, of course, also in the landscapes, once a painter loves some colors, it doesn't matter if it is a landscape painting or a, uh, machinery or wood or whatever, um, we tend to use similar colors in uh, several paintings. So Osiris gold, I would say not too different than uh, Queen Acredon gold and I use it in, in the same purpose idea so that I lay a warm color that will show through in the uh, next uh, Layers. Chemodite genuine is one of my most loved colors. One, because it is a beautiful, beautiful granulating color. Second, because I love to create rich uh, darks, especially using this with uh, Mayan dark blue or uh, with uh, Perilene or several other colors added to some non-granulating colors and you can get uh, another variety of uh, granulating mixes. It's an uh, absolute must for a watercolor painting in my eyes. Pyrrol Scarlet, Lunar Blue, Bloodstone. I, I, I'm trying to think of one painting in the last two years that I didn't use Bloodstone. Still trying to find one. Okay, I'm still trying to find one, but no, cannot find one. And, and then Cascade Green, I think you all know how much I love this color because it is a color like Moonglow uh, that can be used all by itself and you can finish a painting only by using this color, it's enough. It can produce a wide variety of colors, ranges, uh, values, uh, range of values, colors, and yeah, that's more than enough. So other colors that I use are um, thalo blue. I use it for the skies, lavender. That's a color that most of the artists love. Uh, Sleeping Beauty. Turquoise. Uh, this is mostly for accents, but what kind of accents you can achieve with this? I mean, I don't use it in layers very rarely, but for accents, it is uh, phenomenal. It is fantastic. So, in order not to only speak but to show, I will start with some. Queen Acridon gold. And probably I can, instead of doing in plain paper, I can try to do a couple of washes in possible subjects. So here you see uh, a subject that I used, well, not the, the same subject, of course, but a rendering that I use lately in some of my uh, semi abstract but also figurative at the same way, landscapes where I present some uh, kind of rocks and trees and so on. So imagine some rocks here, I don't paint any details. I will add some water at the area that is reserved for the rocks. And I will add some green acridone gold. and then just water to let it flow. As you see, I tilt the block. This is an arch block, 300 grams. And what I love in this case is that the colors 
flow, they create their own thing. I don't care about several details for the moment. Then I might add a little bit of burnt sienna. Add water, press so that the colors flow, uh, flow, the water runs. If it doesn't, I will help it to run just like this. Okay, that's enough for the moment. So, George, yes, please. Uh, do you prefer to work at a slight slant? Um, if I like to have the board tilted, let's say. Yes. Yeah. This is the question. Yes, uh, in some cases, but not always. Uh -huh. It depends on the subject and it depends on, on what I'm trying to achieve as a result. Now I'm adding a little bit of Piemont Dijem. And again, I could have used a sprayer here, but it's the same thing. May I'm I letting... ask, yes, are you please. working from wet tube colors or from a dry pan or the sticks? These are uh, colors that I put on my palette. So this is fresh quinacridone gold, but I used some serum, some uh, burnt sienna that was in the palette. So Thank no, you. The, these are not sticks, uh, although I have no problem working with sticks. Um, they are mostly useful when you go um, uh, outside plein air and you don't have to carry a pallet. That's much better there. Um, I will add some touches of Queen Acridon gold at the area of the trees. Then we may continue there with um, colors like uh, cascade green or some darker colors or any other green actually. Um, while it is still semi-wet, semi-dry, I can add some touches of water so that I create more texture here. And this Your will create, yes, please. Do you um, mainly always use the, the quinacridone gold or another yellow color as a base, uh, well, as a foundation yeah. for, for quinacridone other? Quinacridone gold is a color that I trust, I respect, I love. And I think that it has supported me very well so far. So when you have a winning team, you don't easily change it. On the other hand, I said that I also use uh, Osiret Gold, which I hold a similar in uh, idea uh, to the uh, Quinacridone Gold or Quinacridone Gold Deep or any other color. Um, but uh, as I'm, I was saying today uh, to John and I'm saying several times, the fact that we are using some colors because I, uh, we love them doesn't mean that we should stick to them only. And I, uh, as you know, Angela, I believe that I am mostly um, a value painter than a painter who relies on the colors. But my question was more, excuse me, my question was more rather than the color, if you always use the light color under uh, the other colors. Oh yes, oh yes, yeah. Um, I, I use it as a first layer because uh, this will keep glowing and giving warmth to the next layers. But in some cases, I will use it as a color that gives light to a dark layer. So I may start adding a dark layer and here and there, I will add some uh, quinacridone gold or red, uh, osirate gold in order to give some life, some uh, uh, light to the dark area. There are several, several colors by Daniel Smith that I like for this reason, I mean, to give light. And um, one is cerulean blue. I believe it gives beautiful light to darks. And the other one I'm trying to remember, but I cannot remember the name. It is a violet and it, it has some, some royal name. Imperial purple. Imperial purple. Yes, I could not remember the name. A royal. <laughs> yes, it was something royal. 
in this. <laughs> but anyway, so um, now here I have uh, prepared the idea of some posters on top of, let's say, wood. So how can I create some like texture instead of using Queen Acridone Gold in this way? I'm a little bit harsh to my brush. You see, I'm behaving in a way that Ricard Escoda would be perhaps mad at me, but their brushes are so good that they can stand this abuse. And I'm removing some of the extra water and using a dry brush. Uh, gestural uh, application of color. I create the effect of uh, the veins of wood. So I'm starting to create the feeling and texture of wood. So now I'm very, I'm working very fast. Normally it takes more time. I would probably try to find the right amount of water uh, before I go to this area, but you already see that we create the feeling of uh, veins. Of course, it's a, it's a first layer only. And you understand that there is so little paint that you can barely see it, but it still, it still gives some color to the teeth of the paper. So, this is another way of starting with textural paints. Now, I will leave this dry a little bit, or I can already play a little bit with the sky. Let's add some sky here and let it be cerulean blue. Again, mostly water. It is important to think ahead and to decide where you want to apply color. I always speak about an effect like the uh, chessboard. So where you plan to have something dark like the trees, don't go too dark with the sky or other things. Let the color flow in another area, cover another area let enough contrast to be visible here. You see in many cases, I tilt the board. I like to tilt the board. I like to tilt the um, block instead of moving only with my brush. And this gives me the chance to have greater control over the edges. So suggestion of the sky, the sky is almost never a star in my paintings. Unlike other artists who love the sky and create wonders with, with the sky, I try to bring the interest into the foreground um, to have the center of interest in another area. So let's say if we are okay with this for the moment. I will let it, this dry and I will go to another to show more of these colors. So this is a Sandorini uh, painting. I have already shown parts of it in several cases, but let's say I would like to paint here the dome. The dome would be some of the colors that I like. Angela knows that I like, first of all, cerulean blue. Let's start with the colors that we talked about. And you see that I'm starting in an area that is leaving some other places untouched, suggesting probably that the light comes from this way, tilting the board. So George, is that the Daniel Smith cerulean blue? Yes, all of you, you said uh, Daniel Smith what? Cerulean blue. blue. So yes, it is cerulean blue by Daniel Smith. Yes, 
Yes. Okay, I have a cerulea blue on my palette that was my mother's and it's really milky. It doesn't look anything like that. Really? I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to get yeah. the Daniel Smith. I have, it is this one. It, I don't know how it looks, of course, uh, on the internet, right? I no, mine, not... mine doesn't look anything like that. It's very milky. It, it, and I don't know what it was. It was my mother. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll have to buy that. It's different than mine. It's beautiful Thank you. in this granulation. It is beautiful. It is uh, transparent. And um, <clears throat> I use it in the skies. Definitely it is uh, a color mixer for my, now I went. To the end, we but... we have another question online asking yes. from Buffy if you're using traditional cerulean or cerulean chromium hue. No, oh, it's cerulean, the traditional cerulean. Yes, traditional. I will add some phthalo blue now. Of course, this color is really dominating, very dominating. So I must use it uh, with care, cannot go too uh, heavily with it, but it gives beautiful color. And as I go to the right, I add this to give more interest to the painting. And I'm going against gravity, as you see. So I'm adding in a way that the water that is already in the paper uh, resists that the uh, color, this color mm -hmm. flows upwards that way and by adding some water I'm already mixing on the paper and this is something I always do, I mix on the paper, I, I don't mix on the palette okay, let's not say always, sometimes I may mix on the palette but this will be uh, this will not be the rule, this will be the exception and let's move to the third color that I will use. This is Indian Throne Blue, the absolute color for the Sandorini domes. A color that can be very transparent, but at the same time, it can go really very dark. So it's up to you how much uh, you add, how much water you add and what effects it will create. So once again, mixing on the paper, going against gravity. So this way I'm, well, as much as I can, controlling where it will flow, how it will flow. Tilting again the block so that I control the edges. It is so much easier to control the edges like using a pencil as we learned to write when we were uh, children. I George, like... what do you mean when you say going against gravity? What do you mean by that? When I add color, Angela, like this, um, the water that is already in uh, on the surface uh, wants to flow to the other direction. So going against gravity, um, I am making the color stay where I put it. Otherwise it could, if I do that, it will flow as you see here in the other direction. No, I want it to yes. stay in the other direction. This is why I feel the boat and I use gravity as part of my, uh, you know, uh, like a brush. Mm. Gravity actually is one of, of our brushes. So interesting. George, did you say that now you have a tailor blue on this mix? Someone, someone is to ask. I, I have, I have three colors now. Okay, what's the uh, three colors? Cerulean blue, salo blue, and then Indian throne blue. Okay. And yeah. I would let this dry, although it is already becoming an interesting color. But I 
fold it as a as a basis. When this dries, I I would go with them. I would start by wetting this area, and then I would go with more Intanthrone, Mayandar Blue, Moon Glow, and possibly Black. Uh, come on. Bloodstone uh, to the right part, not black, bloodstone, I want to see. okay. So you see that this way I create variation of colors. And what I say, as long as this stays transparent, I have no problem. If I lose transparency in the first layers, then I do have a problem. Um, and to me, transparency is the fact that I can still see details within the color. And if I draw, a not here, of course, but if I draw a line, if I want to create texture here, I can still do it. So this must be transparent so that it gives me chances to work further in this area. <clears throat> what other color should I talk about? Because it's not about creating a painting, but uh, using colors. Colors that I love. Burn tiger side, possibly tiger side a little bit to the ochre end, but burn tiger side a little bit warmer and bloodstone. Where would I use it? Let's say this area. This area is part of a building. And as the uh, light comes this way, we may suggest that this area is um, dark, it is in shadow. Once again, you see that we don't use a photo, we imagine, we think, we have made uh, our uh, decisions, we have made our mind, then we go without having to follow anything. We just evaluate what we see and then we go uh, accordingly. So let's create these two things dark and granulating, which means dark, but interesting. So I will use these three colors, possibly in order to continue with several colors, I will add Moon Glow as well. So these four colors, but as I want to create something that will be interesting, I have to start with what? Always bloodstone. I know with no, 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 no. Come on, come on, no. Yeah, Yellow, uh, um, gold, quinacridon uh, gold. Quinacridon. If if Stella is with us, she says quaffer. Yes. Right. Yes. So, <clears throat> so quaffer. You you're keeping us awake, right? <laughs> ah, good. Thank you for telling me. Yeah. I'm trying to keep my secrets right. Not really. Not really. All right. So I'm tilting the boards, trying to have enough here. Now, where would I speak about transparency? Now I have to decide. Transparency would be most visible in the inside. So in order to achieve that, let's give some more glow to the inside. I do not want transparency towards the edges. So towards the edges, I need to have more texture. Uh -huh. Let's add some burnt tiger side. And before the painting is too dry, I will start at the edges, uh -huh. adding this beautiful color. Normally I had this um, decoration that was a decoration on the wall. I will cover it. You see that I don't care to erase the pencil, the pencil line, I will cover it. Because I tend to paint so dark when I want that the pencil lines will be eventually covered. And you see that I'm working especially towards the edges, but I'm not doing too much at the center of the painting. And 
one could already, I mean, John, who is next to me, can already see that a lot of texture is starting to take place to be created here. So now I have the advantage that my paper is wet, so I can have the time to take some Munglo, let's say. All right, Munglo, straight from the tube. You see that once again, I'm not mixing on the palette. All mixing is done on the paper. Even I, that I am over the painting, I have trouble already seeing the pencil line. So pencil lines are not important to me. They are not uh, enemies. Actually, when I start sketching in my watercolors, I use very, very strong pencil lines because I'm sure that uh, going darker and darker as I go, we can't see you. Yes, I'm trying to. Yeah, sorry, I'm joking. Thank you for reminding me. Is it better now? Yes. Good. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank yes. you for reminding me. You know, sometimes we have secrets and we don't want to show everything, right? <laughs> we all know how selfish you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me that as well. <laughs> okay, um, I have to be careful because we have water accumulating uh, at the bottom. Yes. Is there a question? No? I don't think so. Okay. I think just the mic went on. All right, so the pencil line is definitely gone. I don't even see it. And I will add, while it is still wet, bloodstone more generously, because that is the absolute granulate. And you see still, remind me not to go outside the picture. Uh, let's have some thirsty, thirsty brass, and thirsty brass means that I take the water away from the brass, and then I remove the excess water from the painting. We okay. have a question on Facebook asking about what size of brush are you using from James Coleman. Thank you. This is a number eight, a Skoda Reserva. This is a number eight. But I mean, I could, I could have used any brass, uh, not too small, but not too large either. And uh, another thing that you will see me doing is uh, I may finish a painting even with one brush. I don't feel the necessity of changing brushes all the time, although I will do it, but I don't feel the necessity. If I feel like it, I will do it. If I don't feel like it, I don't have to change brushes. In what circumstances would you use a variety of brushes? Especially if I need to paint uh, a large area and I need, let's say, a heavy brush or a, a large brush, large rounded brush, whatever, flat, that would be the case. Uh, if I go to details, then it's almost impossible to go with, uh, I mean, details um, of the size of a miniature. I, I would not be able to do with a brush that uh, would be of size eight or 10 or something like that. Now you see that I'm going in the opposite side and creating the edge there. I could not have stayed yellow over there, but you see that the center is still glowing because I'm not touching it with the, um, uh, the other colors. This is why I like to use granulating colors or dark colors over Queen Acridone gold. Although I have, and of course you cannot see it right now, but if this uh, dries, it will be more than visible that, John, you can be a witness. We already have a lot of granulation all over and the glow that we, we need. Another thing is that as we speak about the vertical wall, 
the lines, the drips of color must be vertical. This is why I kept my uh, block tilted. So I guess that is okay for the moment. I will try to remove the excess water because I would not like to have um, flowering if I don't cause it. And another thing, the pencil line, John, Good. I don't even see it. And one thing that helps to cover that is, first of all, dark colors, then granulation. That's granulation creates so many small spots that make the eye disperse it. You're lost there. That's so beautiful. It's, it's not quite showing up on my iPad as it, beautiful as it is. It's not, it possible. Right there. It's it's not possible to beautiful. see. And, oh, yeah, I know, yeah, I know it's not possible to see because there are so many colors here. There is a purple, there is a greenish color created yeah. here, uh, brownish colors, uh, darker one, uh, such a variety. And I must George. say, yes, please. Excuse me. Um, uh, did you use any Munglo or yet? Yes, yes or I how? did. Yes. Ah. I said so, that the colors I used were Bern Tiger's Eye, Queen Acridon Gold as a basis, Bloodstone was the last one that I added, and Munglo was, I think, the second or no. Bern Tiger's Eye was the second, Munglo, third, Bloodstone, the fourth. These uh -huh. were the okay. four So the purple, the purple comes from the Munglo. Munglo, exactly. Although Bloodstone can, can give a reddish purple stone under uh, circumstances, but or it can, it can can show like that when compared to other colors because sometimes we understand and read color differently when it is applied next to certain colors. So that is as much as I could do right now with these colors. So I have shown this as well. What else do I have here? Um, two colors that I love to use as darks which means as black, which means black, but not black. It's Piemont Dye Genuine and Mayan Dark Blue. So let's try to say that I would like to paint, now I will use a smaller brush, number six, a Skoda brush. So let's, let's say I would like to paint a little bit of the window instead of of course, I will rush. Uh, normally, I, I will start with yellow, when I put on gold, then something else, and so on. And I will, I would, uh, no, I will do it in another piece of paper. So, it's actually quite beautiful. Let's go here and say that I want to play black. First of all, I will use black. So, this is black. Which black is that, George? This is lunar black. Lunar black. The color that I love most because apart from, from black, it is granulated. So this is black. And it's good to see you here, Yes, bro. I was not very generous. And perhaps it doesn't show very well on the screen. I'm not sure how it shows. Like gray, perhaps I will, I will use some more black. Yeah, that's more like it. Black, black is black. But black is okay. There was uh, a book on chess that was named Black. It was titled Black is okay saying that you can play equally, equally well with black as you can play with white. For me, black is okay because I can use it without any fear that I'm going against rules about transparency or pure watercolor or whatever. I really don't care so much about such rules. So let's go with uh, Megan Dark and Piano Dark. One of the rare cases that I will mix on the palette. 
So in order to create this black, I will mix all the value. And if I'm not satisfied, I will be adjusting on the paper. So from then on, I will be adjusting on the paper if something doesn't prove to be okay. So let's say that I want to paint something. We have a question in Facebook from yes. Caroline Diebel asking, Hi, Caroline. George, how do you manage to keep the intensity of the colors as the paper dries? This is something my students often struggle with, and it would be great to hear your opinion from experience. Thank you. The intensity of the colors, well, it's not possible to, to retain the intensity of the colors. So you must, uh, you must apply the amount of color that is necessary, because as the color dry, they will eventually become lighter in value. But um, I think it is a, a matter of experience practice to know how much color you will apply so that it ends um, to the value that you expect. On the other hand, I would not be against or I would not have any problem if the color ends uh, lighter. The only thing that I would be afraid to, to do is lose the transparency. So, if it ends lighter, then I can always re-wet gently and go uh, on an, with another layer or not re-wet and go with a wet layer on top or do whatever I want. So, that, I mean, there is no rule. Uh, I don't know if this answered the question and I don't know if you see in comparison black to black. This is May and Dark with Piemontite. This is uh, lunar black. If we try to compare, I'd say that it, this might be even darker than this. Mm -hmm. This has a beautiful granulation because it is lunar black, and you know we don't need to talk about that. It is another granulating machine, but this is a dark that I love to have in my paintings because when it dries, you will see not from the internet. It's impossible, but in reality, you will see the two colors mixing on the paper. And this gives more life, let's say, to the darks. It's not a dead black dark. Although nothing is wrong with a dead black dark. I don't care about that time. Just saying that I prefer to have this mixture or another mixture that, uh, in fact, I like to have uh, with Piemontai genuine is with Perilene green, another lively dark. You, you have to, to try on that, we'll see how important they are. Um, I don't know if I have to speak about quinacridone burnt orange. I believe that any painter who respects his watercolors has this color. It is a fantastic color. And although it's not what I would do here, but let's play with this here right now. Let me try to create the effect of the rocks painting positively, pos positively and negatively around them. So I would create the feeling of the rocks. No pencil line here, but I feel like I could create another rock which is close to what, how much time do we have? <laughs> don't, let, don't let me get carried away. I, I can teach till the morning. It's not teaching, I can, I can be shown till the morning. At, at least 15 minutes, George. 15 minutes, so I'd, I'd rather stop because we won't. Um, what I said now reminded me that um, Catherine asked me and John, to show something that could be interesting. John said before that I like to uh, paint what I want instead of paint, painting what I see. So um, I have sent uh, a couple of slides that would be interesting yes. because they would show you a couple of pictures that I took. 
and how they were uh, reproduced in paintings. And the paintings, of course, have the same idea, but on the other hand, they are different as well. Do you want me to share yeah, them now, George? If you want, so I stop painting, yeah. Okay. It's a good idea so that you make me stop. <laughs> so I stop. <laughs> so right, one, of the things, one of the things that's always asked is mm -hmm. from the artist, um, can we see your reference photo, et cetera? Wow. And one of the interesting things that George was telling me in the car today is, John, when I am looking at a subject and we were looking at monasteries on a mountain, um, is I look at it and then I turn around to paint and my painting never looks at exactly as the real thing behind me because I do my, I do my own interpretation of it. It looks, it looks a lot like it, but there's just uh, subtle differences. And uh, I thought that was just be very interesting for you to see those as examples. All right. Should I share yes, screen now, John? Yes, yes, please. Okay. There you go. I love... I love the quote, never let the facts get in the way of a good painting. <laughs> it's on the screen now, uh, George and John. So this is, this is um, a door um, that I found in Metzovo mm -hmm. that, was, as you see it, uh, no color in it, uh, just some rust that attracted my eye. I, I always, I'm always attracted to rust, like, you know, the mosquitoes to light. The Listen, George, thing. today I took a photo just for you. Oh, full of, of mosquitoes? Uh, no, of uh, a boat <laughs> full of rust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is uh, the, the painting that came out of it. If you can go back and forth, you will see how different they are. Imaginary colors, imaginary uh, things on the right part of the wall, like... Uh, uh, white, uh, I don't know, paint, uh, just name it. I don't have to, to think or explain what it is, as long as I like it, as long as it creates some rhythm, some texture, I don't care. A number that is imagined there like a door has possibly a number of the house that was, that is located there, and so many things, things that are not in the actual photo. This is a door that I found in Veria, in another city. Um, and this is the painting out of it. So once again, uh, I keep the main idea. You may come back again to show, if you can, that there are some shadows like that. There are, uh, there are these uh, wooden parts of the door, but from then on, I change that, I change the colors, um, I give the colors I like, because I don't see the photo anymore. I sketch and then I continue as I want, because going uh, like the photo makes you sometimes slave um, in uh, trying to imitate, to copy what you see, and I don't like, I don't like that, I, I want to paint. So creation is an important thing. Here you see another door that I found, I cannot remember where. And the next photo is what I created out of it. Can you go and back to that one, Ethel? So I imagine things, I imagine a window I see. And that was for me uh, the meaning no, uh, the title was uh, Confined, so that was a painting that I did during the pandemic, uh, when, when we had the lockdowns, and um, uh, I saw the bars, I, I imagined the window, and I said, okay, this can give the feeling of uh, being behind the bars, behind the windows, as we were confined. The next one is something that I found near our summer house in uh, Kaligradia. And uh, it is an agricultural, I don't know what exactly, instrument, machine. Uh, as you see, that is what I saw. 
And the next is a painting that was created out of it with a lot of imagined colors and um, textures and background shapes that were not in reality, but were uh, part of the part of the composition because the composition must be balanced in colors, in contrasts, in shapes, in diagonals, in curves, in everything. And um, this was a watercolor that earned me, earned me a couple of awards in the national show. So I think it is important to show what the photo initially was and what was painted out of it. So that's it. I don't think I have other photos in this small PowerPoint. I have other PowerPoints similar to that, uh, showing where you can start and how you can end up in a painting. In the meantime, you see in this painting that as we go with layers, we create contrasts, negative values, some flower in here when I threw water, but I love this here because it can be useful texture later. Some uh, taking advantage of um, granulation and step by step like this, I would create paintings like the ones that John and Catherine saw in my exhibition today. Uh, these are totally imagined. I mean, uh, I start from a sketch and then I get carried away. I do whatever I want and I see what happens on the paper and then I respond to that. Uh, I, I, I guess I should be finishing with all that, but before I finish, I am not sure if we can see a little bit more of what has been done here. Trying to find some angle that, yeah. So you can see the textures, the colors, the glow. And I wanted to say back then that I, I stopped for some reason that actually I must admit, I'm not the one who creates that. It's the Daniel Smith colors. So I'm just taking advantage of the colors here. Um, I was using when I started other colors, it, it was not possible to create this or it was possible, but I had to struggle. And now you just lay the colors and it happens. This is what I tell uh, my students in my workshop. Sometimes, well, well you, you can do with any color, such, okay, go buy any color. But sometimes you will struggle to have a, a result that you are after. If you don't have a good paper, if you don't have good colors, if you don't have good, brush, good brushes, you will struggle. It's as, as simple as that. Okay. For individuals on a budget, can you uh, give a recommendation for where to put their the 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 money first? Do you put invest in the paper first, in the brushes first, or in the pigment first? For when you're starting I, with the budget, I, I will tell you what I told. Uh, we draw for hours, so I, we could speak for hours with John and Kathy, and I told them one thing that when I started painting, I started going. Try, first of all, I set my, uh, uh, my dreams very high without any reason at all, because I was really an amateur and nothing more. But I wanted to learn and I wanted to try hard. And I was following uh, several uh, magazines from USA, from England. I was going to England to see the RI shows because I wanted to become a member of the Royal Institute. And I was uh, following the American Watercolor Society. These were the two targets I had set in my first steps. So when I started, I said, there is one thing I cannot afford after seeing that I was not successful in my first tries. I said, one thing, I'm an amateur. The second thing, I don't have the right tools. So I said, I cannot afford not I cannot afford to buy the brass. I cannot afford not to buy the brasses. I cannot afford not to buy the right colors. I cannot afford not to buy the good paper. Otherwise I will st stay like that. I can 
make small steps, but I will never produce something good. And then I bought all that. So I understand how frustrating it may be when you buy something that is a little bit more expensive when you find other things similar, actually not similar at all, but similar. Because brushes, brushes, not the same. Colors, colors, not the same. So when you buy something more expensive, you will, you will see the results in your paintings. It's like wanting to be a plumber, is that the right word, mm -hmm. plumber? Mm -hmm. And not having the right tools. Can you do work? I think not. Does this answer the question? I'm not sure. But this is my point. Thank you. George? Yes? Would you consider yourself uh, in your kind of art that you do to be a, a, an abstract realist? Hmm. It is very difficult to put labels in my work, even for me. <laughs> uh, before I continue, I see that here I have some kind of swatches. Ah, no, we don't see it. Uh, that were prepared for a workshop, and you see how we deal with different textures and the colors. Uh, sorry for showing that, but bloodstone and burnt sienna, bloodstone, mega. Make a dark dry brush, dry brush over wash, spattering with quinacridone gold, many things that can be useful to create texture. Um, so um, I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that. I, I, I can say that I, I start from uh, uh, an idea that comes from uh, reality. I go for a figurative painting, but I'm not a photorealist. Sometimes my paintings go a little bit to that end, but a little bit to that end, because I don't really want to be a photorealist. So, um, yeah, you can call me like that. I will answer. <laughs> you can call me Nick, I can answer. You can call me Peter, I can answer. So George, can, can you take about, you know, five minutes and show people your gallery and your art? Because yes. I think yes. you, go, you, you have so many different types of art you do. I think they'd be kind of excited so, about that. Okay. If you're, so George does do um, workshops. He's a phenomenal artist as you've seen and, and, and will see in his uh, workshop. So this is my, my studio. It is... I do not try that. I do not. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Because I'm taking some distance from the microphone. Perhaps I have to. I think. I think. Shout a little bit more. No, I think people can hear you. All right. So uh, these are. First of all, this is the swing. It is uh, one hundred square meters plus. And I have paintings uh, from uh, Santorini, quite a few. Mount Athos. This is actually an mixed media painting with collage and watercolor over the collage. More Santorini paintings. Some of my paintings that have references to pain of people, refugees, immigrants. I have created another series of paintings like that. These are my Daniel Smith colors. And I have to thank several people, but they know, so I will not say names. Uh, Sandorini, mixed media. I love that one, George. Some the dip Excuse me? Oh, this no, one, I, lo yes. I love the diptych, the diptych. Yes, and we were together in uh, uh, Spain. Caudete, in Caudete. They exhibited together with Angela, and I have this. 
several large scale, large scale uh, campuses there. Because I have a place to hold the campuses. How about these Here George? is a place where we have the uh, workshops, the tables changed from one place to another. Here it is a series with uh, reference to the Holocaust uh, and refugees. This is a subject matter that means a lot to me. I must admit that this, which is another reference to the uh, pain caused in our days, is a sketch that I did during exams. It started from a sketch I did during exams as I'm a teacher in our high school. So I used that sketch to create this picture. So this is a former student of mine. Don't let her, don't tell her. So George is a, is a physics teacher. George, um, is he speaking? Yes. No, he's just uh, showing you all his paintings. I'm coming. He's coming back. George. <laughs> yes. George. Uh, um, paintings that you're showing us of the buildings that are all, uh, white, that, that town it, in Greece, is it not? Santorini. Uh, Santorini. Yeah. It, I've got to say, I've had a go at painting that once or twice, and it is one of the hardest things I've ever had to paint. Getting those white values and, and keeping it like that vibrant white by just adding the various bits that connect it is such a hard painting. You are saying it's very hard for the, the picture century that you're doing to, to have that white, white, to, to show that white that you show. Yes, but uh, it is, uh, it is the paper. I mean, uh, the white is the paper and if you paint darker, this is the, okay, once again, some people like Angela know that uh, when I when I want to suggest the white, then the surface next to it becomes really dark. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going. I'm not. I say if if I paint next to a dark shape, then I will go very very light, almost with water, and a little bit of pigment. If I'm going to paint next to white. I'm going very strongly, strongly with pigment because I want to create the maximum of contrast in most of the areas, not, mm -hmm. not all over the painting, but when I want to create an, a center of interest, then this is what I do. And I call this the chessboard effect, white square next to black square, and then white square, and the black square. And this is what the painters uh, hold as positive and negative painting with maximum contrast though. George, there is a comment by Janie Lowell Smith. She says, engaging both sides of the brain, academic and artistic, marvelous. <laughs> Possibly, or perhaps it is restricting because if I was just an artist, I could be better as an artist, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you, you never know the answers. So uh, many times I catch myself planning too much. Even when I paint something like this, which seems to be very simple, um, you know that I stop, I evaluate, I don't, I will not paint this in half an hour. Even if it is something as simple as that, I will stop, I will evaluate, I will say, now where I need contrast? What do I need to add? Where should I remove color and so on? 
And planning is something that really comes perhaps naturally, perhaps because of my background as a physicist, or most possibly because of my, I repeat this, because I feel I owe a lot to chess because of my chess background. It has taught me to plan ahead, to think well before doing a move. And this is why in most of my uh, sessions, demos, workshops, I say that I paint one time and I think four times. This is my recipe, one to four. Paint one, think four. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining today. George, thank you. It's, uh, it's a little about 1.30 in the morning here. So now I know what the rest of the world we can is go doing. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for, for uh, joining today. George, thank you. George has been absolutely wonderful. Um, again, George does demonstrations and workshops here in Greece. Please, if you're interested, look up um, his site. My uh, Facebook, whatever, and Facebook. I would, I, I'll be uh, more than glad to answer any questions, no matter if we are speaking about the uh, workshop, any questions that I can answer, I cannot answer any questions, mm -hmm. but I would be glad to, to try at least. Thank you. And tomorrow we have uh, uh, Giovanni Balzarini is going to be doing uh, watercolor ground and sticks. So. I appreciate uh, both these gentlemen for, for, for being up so late um, and all of you. Thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you, George. Bye. Thank you, guys. Love you. Bye. Miss you. Bye.